today's theme is using your logical reasoning skills in reading comprehension. And although there is a lot more to be said about reading comp, it's not all going to be captured in the points that we address today. I think that a lot of students just lose sight of the fact that reading comprehension is actually very similar to logical reasoning. And the LSAT is testing skills that uh, are uh, that the both sections have in common. Um, those skills are identifying points of view, uh, understanding the support for those points of view, uh, understanding the purpose uh, underlying particular paragraphs, underlying the, the, the particular sentences, uh, just getting a sense of the overall structure of a passage in the same way that you might do with a logical reasoning question. Um, that's Those skills are in common in both sections. Where there are some differences, I think, are reading comp does not necessarily test the uh, identification of flaws as much. Um, it's still there, but it's not the emphasis of the section, unlike it is for logical reasoning. Um, and in addition, I think in reading comprehension, they do test your memory a little bit more uh, because they will give you lists of things. Um, they will give you lists of, uh, of support rather than just one item of support. They might list out three or four. Um, rather than just emphasizing one point of comparison, they might tell you three differences between, uh, you know, one kind of oil drilling and another kind of oil drilling. But aside from those differences, uh, they're very similar. And I think if you feel more comfortable with logical reasoning than reading comp, it can really help to think about reading comp as if it were almost the same as logical reasoning. So what I want to do is just briefly go into um, a couple of the points here on this diagram, and then we'll look at um, a very short example that um, I've adapted um, on my own, just um, an example of maybe how to read a passage. Um, but then, of course, the most valuable will be turning to some real examples. Um, so first of all, I just want to um, emphasize, uh, remember from last week, we were identifying different pieces of an LR stimulus. And essentially, we can and should be doing the same thing for reading comprehension, right? Um, when you are reading, by far the most important thing to focus on is what are the different points of view? Um, very often, the author will have their own point of view, uh, and there, there will also be a point of view of some other person or some other group. And we want to make sure that we identify those points of view that they actually maybe even dominate our understanding of the passage. You know, rather than thinking of the passage as making a bunch of equally important points, it's totally fine if those lines where the points of view are expressed are just in highlighter uh, in your mind. You can mark it uh, on uh, using the highlight if you want as well, but I just mean in your mind, those lines should be standing out in bold. And then almost as important would be any support that is provided for those views. Why do those people think what they think? Um, but we should also be thinking about other roles as well. So do you remember some other common roles would be maybe the passages describing some fact or observation that needs to be explained? Why is Instagram becoming less popular and TikTok becoming more popular. Um, a, a paragraph could start off or a passage could start off with a paragraph that goes into that. Um, sometimes the role is just its background introducing the topic and then we're going to get points of view about that topic later on. Um, also, very often you're going to get concession points or potential criticisms. So the author is making their, their own point. We should, um, instead of dictating, um, disaster response, we should interact with and be informed by the communities that we're trying to help. Um, and then they may make a, a potential criticism of their own points. Some might say that, uh, interacting with the communities is not as useful as relying solely on expert opinion. 
And then the author will then follow that up with a rebuttal of that criticism. So, you know, there's a lot of variety in reading comp, but I think what you'll find is it, when you're thinking about the structure of different parts of a passage, um, both in terms of the purpose of a paragraph, but also in terms of the purpose of individual sentences, it is going to be captured largely by what I have on, on the screen here. Um, so there are exceptions, of course, and in other sessions, we'll go into other aspects of reading comp, but um, it might help to to realize that uh, it, it is very similar to logical reasoning in that these are basically the central pieces that we're dealing with, all right? Um, I think logical reasoning also uh, is similar to reading comp in terms of the habits that we want to be using. Um, so what are those reading habits? Well, I think it's important to read one piece at a time, right? And what I mean by that is, just go one sentence, stop and think about it. Okay, then do the next sentence, stop and think about it, and then so on. And then at the end of a paragraph, you stop and try to identify the main point of that paragraph before you move on to the next. So when people are first starting out in reading comp, and actually even when they're very experienced, um, I think the time pressure can make people just read faster than they should. Um, maybe read uh, faster than they would in logical reasoning, right? In logical reasoning, I think you're more in tune with the idea that you have to pay attention to the shift from one sentence to the next. Um, and we have to be equally aware of that uh, when it comes to reading comprehension. So what are some other habits? Well, translating words that refer to other things. So that's um, that's really important. Uh, for example, if a passage starts talking about the former view versus the latter view, you have to make sure you take the time to just understand by former view, they're talking about the view that history is cyclical. By the latter view, they're talking about the, uh, the view that um, history is linear or something like that. Just making sure that those references actually mean something in your mind and you're, you can replace whatever reference they give you with the, the bigger picture, the full subject. All right. And we'll see that in essentially every single passage. Um, I think another skill, a habit that you want to bring over from logical reasoning is splitting up paragraphs that have multiple points. So, you know, in logical reasoning, we're very used to a uh, stimulus where you start off with someone else's argument, right? And then you turn to the author's argument. Well, it's the same thing in, in reading comprehension, right? An individual paragraph, it may actually be easier to split that into two. In the first half, they're conceding the uh, a particular point. In the second half, this is where the author um, gives their actual opinion. Um, and when you have a really long paragraph, that starts listing out a whole bunch of details and, and examples, well, it can help to split that up and say, okay, so in the first third, this is the, the main point. In the second third, they're giving me three examples. Um, so just get in that habit because uh, I think, um, again, the, the thing you want to avoid is just treating the whole passage as one one large block of text treating a single paragraph as just one large block of text when really there's often two three sometimes four points being made within a particular paragraph and it's totally fine to like make your own paragraph breaks mentally at least all right so one more thing that um, i want to talk about before we look at some examples how else is logical reasoning similar to reading comprehension well, when it comes to question strategy. Now, we can get into, you know, specific question types in reading comp. Um, I thought maybe I would talk about that, but um, that's a little bit too specific. I just want to talk about the general pointers here. And so the first general pointer is, just like in logical reasoning, depending on the question type, you know that you should be having an answer in mind before you go to the answer choices, right? In logical reasoning, if you're asked, what's the main conclusion, you know that you should have that in mind before you go to the answers. Um, if you're asked, what is flawed about the argument above? Uh, 
you know that you should probably think what's wrong with the argument first before you look at the answers. And so similarly, in reading comprehension, there's a whole bunch of questions where you actually can anticipate. And I'm not just talking about main point, primary purpose, or author attitude. This also extends to questions where they refer you back to particular parts of the passage, questions where they ask you, like, what would the 18th century critic of, of environmentalism most likely agree with? Because if you can remember the viewpoint that that person had, um, the support that they said, then you can actually just stop and, and have that in mind before you go to the answers. Where people run into problems is if you just go immediately to the answers, you might not uh, you, you might be trapped by those tempting wrong answers. Sometimes you might even just not understand the question as precisely as it needs to be understood. Whereas if you're, whereas if you're in the habit of stopping after the question, thinking about what it's saying, thinking about whether you can predict it, then you're just more likely to notice sometimes there's nuances in, in the way the question is asked. Um, another thing that you probably do in logical reasoning, at least hopefully, is um, reading every word of the answer that you pick. In reading comprehension, I find that a lot of people find it, um, I, they, they think that they either can get away with not reading every an uh, word of that answer, or probably what's more likely is just the time pressure causes them to just move on. You know, like they, it's almost like they skim, they read the first half, then fill in the second half with whatever they think um, the answer is probably going to say. Um, but it's really important to read every word of the answer that you pick, because as you probably know, they do, uh, they do make the first half attractive often. And then the second half, though, has a problem. Um, now, this doesn't mean that you have to read every word of the answers you eliminate, though, because if you're reading the passages well, there should probably be a good number of answers where you already know the first half is wrong. It's not what you're looking for. And so um, that's how you save time in reading comp. But you don't save time in reading comp on rushing the read of whatever you pick. All right. And then the last thing, <clears throat> excuse me, the last thing that I wanted to bring up uh, when it comes to similarities between logical reasoning and reading comp uh, and the question strategy is just paying attention to certain answer choice features. And I don't mean to say that the things like the, the idea of concept shifts or comparisons or answers that are easier to support versus harder to support, I don't mean that these are like always wrong in reading comp or always right. I just mean that when you're reading an answer, there are often certain things that should stand out to you um, and that uh, could could be the basis of a decision, right? So for example, a concept shift. Let's say that um, you remember that the passage said that a particular study was flawed, okay? But now an answer is saying that um, a particular study should be redone. They should do another version of the study. You know, that's that's a shift, and that should cause us to pause. Is is saying that the study is flawed, how similar is that to we should redo the study? Um, you know, maybe it's wrong, depending on the question. It, it could be wrong. Maybe that's an okay shift. Um, you know, the point is not you have to pick exactly the same wording or the exactly the same concept, but that's the kind of thing that we should pay attention to in the same way as we do for logical reasoning. Comparisons. You see this all the time in answer choices in reading comprehension. And sometimes those comparisons, in fact, often those comparisons uh, are wrong or unsupported because they just didn't tell you about the other side of the comparison, right? Um, if we're told that, um, um, that uh, learning uh, languages or it's easy to learn languages when you're young compared to when you're old, well, um, sometimes a wrong answer will then just go into a different com kind of comparison, right? It's uh, easy to learn languages when you're two years old versus when you're eight years old. Is that is that the exactly what was said earlier? Or maybe that's a, a slightly different comparison between two two young people. Um, 
you know, and, and again, I'm not saying that this makes it wrong, but it does mean if you have not been explicitly focusing on these when you're evaluating an answer, um, it makes sense to start focusing on this because that can be a decision point in what makes something right or wrong. All right. And then this last category of stuff that's easier to support versus harder to support. You know, you see this all the time in logical reasoning as well as in, um, reading comprehension. And, uh, there's just certain types of language, certain kinds of concepts that are easier to prove from the passage or from the logical reasoning stimulus and certain kinds of concepts that are harder to prove. So the most, um, I think the most common one that people bring up is the sum, most, all, those quantity words. Does it make sense that it's a lot easier to prove that some fruits are smelly than it is to prove that all fruits are smelly, right? Because if, if you want to prove that some fruits are smelly, you just have to point to that durian or whatever that, you know, there's a certain fruit that, uh, is very smelly, but apparently may taste a lot better than it smells. But if you're trying to prove that all of them are smelly, and sorry about that, um, if you're trying to prove that all of them are smelly, then you have to show literally every single fruit in the world is smelly, right? Um, most, I want to point out, right? Most is such a dangerous word because for some people, it, it doesn't seem that strong, right? Most is like, yeah, you know, a, a lot of people is how they interpret it or a lot of things is how they interpret it. But remember on the LSAT, most has that specific meaning of over 50%. And so when you start reading it that way, it, it, I think most should start falling more into the all category. It doesn't mean the same thing as all, but when it comes to how easy something is to prove, some is a lot easier to prove than most. So I, I don't want to talk about every single one of these items, but um, just kind of pointing out some other very common features that you just want to make, pay attention to. Um, do you see the at the bottom here, one factor versus the only factor? Right? You're familiar with this issue in logical reasoning. When the answer is saying that something is the only factor, well, if you're doing a must be true question or a what's most strongly supported by the passage question, calling something the only factor, it's, it's a very, very, um, high bar to meet. And you want to make sure they really did say that it was the only thing. It's a lot easier to say that something is just one factor, right? Um, the most. That phrase the most. There's so many um, answers where you can get rid of it almost simply because it's saying the most of something, the most of anything. And if it's an uh, inference question where you're looking for what's supported by the passage, that's when this kind of language um, becomes uh, hard to pick. Now remember, depending if you're doing a different kind of question, right, what strengthens the author's argument what w would weaken the physicist position? If you're doing a strengthen or a weaken, then okay, now we actually are okay with this kind of language or it's, it's less of a, of a red flag. All right. Um, now to help demonstrate some of these points. Um, yeah. So Meng is bringing up sometimes they shift the necessary slash only factor and answer choices. Actually. Yeah. I mean, I want to take a look at an example right now, um, of just questions. All right. Um, because you may not realize just how much you can get from studying the answer choices. Even if you don't know what the passage was about, you can have some pretty strong thoughts on what's more likely to be correct, what's less likely to be correct. Um, so take a look at this question here. It can be inferred from the passage that the author would be most likely to agree with which one of the following. Take a look at the answers and tell me what stands out to you as, you know, something to examine, maybe potential red flags. What do you think about answer choice A? Is there a certain phrasing here that stands out as like, well, I need to make sure this thing really was said because it's like a red flag if I'm picking for what can be inferred from the passage. What's the language in answer choice A that might stand out? Um, one juror 
Well, on the in, in judgment on the part of one, you know, I, I I can see what you're saying in the sense that maybe the passage kind of made the point that like that there can be errors um, in judgment on the part of of jury members, but when they start singling out like even one juror is is causing a problem, I could see that. So I'm okay with that. I think the thing that's probably more broadly applicable though is just this language. Yeah, most often, because when you say the most often. You're like ranking this. This is the number one reason that a jury is hung. And that, by the way, means the jury can't come to a decision about guilty or, or not guilty. Um, so most often, you know, I'm not saying A is wrong, but like if I'm going to pick this, I'm going to have to make sure you, they did say this was the number one reason. Right. Um, what about answer choice B? Any language here that we'd say? That seems that seems pretty extreme. I would want to make sure they really did say that. Aside from the material costs of hung juries, the criminal justice system has few flaws. Few flaws. That's like, you, you know, I don't I, I I don't want you to necessarily always bring in your your real life understandings of things. But probably you're familiar with the idea that there's uh, a lot of people criticize the criminal justice system, right? Um, it would be a little bit odd for a passage to say that, you know what, it, the criminal justice system, it has few flaws, right? Um, so again, I'm not saying it's wrong, but if you're going to pick this, you'd want to say, yeah, I actually remember that point. Uh, maybe you, you would want to even find line support for it if you're about to pick it and you don't remember it. Um, C. The fact that jury trials are so rare renders any flaws in the jury system insignificant. Do you see that language there? Any flaws, so all of them, are insignificant? I'm prepared to say this is not going to be the answer, right? Just from, I, I, it doesn't even matter what the passage said. Now again, I'm, I'm saying that for emphasis, maybe, maybe it could be correct. But they do include a lot of these answers where... Um, you know, it shouldn't take you that much time to have a, I think, a, a strong reaction to it. All right. Um, what about D? Um, Dorothy, I'll get to your question after we look at the answers. Um, so D, hung juries are acceptable and usually indicate that the criminal justice system is functioning properly. So what's some language that you'd want to just be sensitive to and just be comfortable with before you... Um, if you are thinking about picking something like D. Can you point out some of those language strength issues? D says, usually indicates that it's functioning properly. Um, acceptable, yeah, I mean, acceptable is, it's, it's an opinion. It could very well be said by the passage, I don't know. Um, so, you know, I don't know, I, certainly D is like better than C. Probably better than A. Um, and I don't want you to take the, what we're doing here too far because there's plenty of answers that are strong, that are correct on inference questions. But I'm just sharing with you, you know, when you really study the answer choices, there are certain things that ideally will stand out to you and will just be, they will either be a red flag that needs, that you have to be more careful about, or they're just specific aspects of answers that if you have not been focused on before, these are the kinds of things that might deserve more focus if you're struggling with reading comp. Um, and then finally, E, hung juries, again, most often occur in a particular situation. Could be the answer, but you'd want to remember, oh yeah, they did say this was the number one reason. All right. 